Welcome to Audit the Audit, where we sort out the who and what and the right and wrong of police interactions. This episode covers interfering, implied consent laws, and DUI blood draws, and is brought to us by Oren Bus's channel. Be sure to check out the description below and give them the credit that they deserve. On July 26, 2017, Detective Jeff Payne of the Salt Lake Police Department entered the University of Utah Hospital in Salt Lake City, Utah, in an attempt to get a blood sample from an unconscious and critically injured patient who had been involved in a fire two-vehicle crash. The accident was caused by the other driver, who was fleeing the Utah Highway Patrol at the time of the crash and was killed in the collision. The Logan Police Department, which was handling the investigation, did not suspect that the patient was intoxicated at the time of the crash, but asked Detective Payne to obtain a blood sample to determine if the patient had any chemical substances in his system. Upon entering the hospital, Detective Payne spoke with nurse Alex Wubbles about obtaining the blood sample, and she informed him that she would need to discuss the situation with hospital administrators administrators to determine whether a blood draw could be authorized. The interaction that followed was captured on Detective Payne's body camera. I'm being threatened with um, to be arrested if I don't allow the officer to draw the blood. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. So I'm going to arrest her. I'm in. We have exigent circumstances for a blood draw on a patient that's upstairs. Officer she is refusing, and my lieutenant says that what, if she what doesn't... What department are you with? Salt Lake City Police. Salt Lake City which I'm sure you'll get to meet my lieutenant soon. And if I don't get to go get the blood, I'm taking her to jail. I'd rather not do that. I'd rather you not do it either. Hi. Can you protect me? I've been threatened to be placed under arrest by this officer here. I'm trying to prohibit him from drawing blood on one of my patients who he does not have a warrant for. If things still keep going the way they're going, I'm arresting her. We can't protect you. For interfering with a criminal investigation. Uh, he's conducting he's an investigation. Uh, okay, I'm just being told what to do by my entire hospital. And I'm being told what to do by, by my boss. Okay, so and I'm going to do what my boss says. There's no reason that this has gotten as elevated as it has. If you want to arrest him, Let's not, we're not doing one thing or another until House 2 gets here, yeah? Yeah, and I've got more of my guys coming up, so. This officer's going to be arrested. He's agreeing with this officer. He needs to have a warrant signed by a judge that says he can draw right. a blood. And he doesn't well. have that. And there's that. also the laws that talk about exigent circumstances and implied consent law, which does apply. Okay, I can have you talk to our private field. Okay, well. But until he says yes, we can't. Okay, she's going to jail. Why? Why? Interfering with the criminal investigation. Okay. Per my watch commander, and I'm not going to argue with him. Detective Payne states that if he is not permitted to draw blood from the unconscious patient, Ms. Wubbles will be arrested for interfering with a criminal investigation. However, it is unclear under which statute this arrest was threatened. According to Section 76-8-305 of the Utah Code, which defines the offense of interference with a peace officer, quote, A person is guilty of a Class B misdemeanor if the person knows, or by the exercise of reasonable care should have known, that a peace officer is seeking to effect a lawful arrest or detention of that person or another person and interferes with the arrest or detention. Because Detective Payne was not attempting to arrest or detain anyone, this statute was plainly inapplicable to Ms. Wubbles' actions. Likewise, Section 76-8-306 of the Utah Code, which defines the crime of obstruction of justice in criminal investigations, does not contain any language that would be relevant to Ms. Wubbles' conduct. We will discuss the legality of the attempted blood draw later in this episode, but assuming only for the sake of argument that Officer Payne was legally authorized Authorized to obtain a blood sample from the unconscious patient, there is a potential argument that denying the blood draw would constitute a violation of Section 76-8-301 of the Utah Code, which defines the offense of interference with a public servant. The statute explains that, quote, an individual is guilty of interference with a public servant if the individual uses force, violence, intimidation, or engages in any other unlawful act with a purpose to interfere with a public servant performing or purporting to perform an official function. However, even if the blood draw was legally authorized, it is doubtful that a court would conclude that Ms. Wubbles engaged in an unlawful act by refusing a blood draw that violated the hospital's policies at the command of hospital administration. Likewise, a prosecutor would struggle to prove that Ms. Wubbles refused the blood draw with the purpose of interfering with Officer Payne's investigation, as she was simply following the terms of her
their employment. Therefore, even assuming that Officer Payne was within his constitutional authority to obtain a blood sample from the unconscious patient, it is unlikely that Ms. Wobbles could be convicted of violating any of these interfering and obstruction of justice statutes. Okay, this is coming from our leadership Okay, well. and it's coming from mine. But I either go away with blood and vials or body and tow. And that's my only choices. So, Payne? This young lady right here right now is not free to go about her business. Her watch command, if she does not allow me to go get a blood draw from a guy up in the burn unit, she's going to jail. And I'm just trying to do what I've been told to do by the hospital. Where's the disconnect? Yes. Yes, What's the problem? They don't want to abide by the implied consent law or exigent circumstances. They want it to be a search warrant. So where's the lieutenant? He's coming in. I've talked to him on the phone. She's talked to him on the phone. He was the first one to tell her that if I don't get the blood, she's getting arrested. I don't know why you have to be so awful and threatening. I'm not here to impede I'm just you. stating what is will happen. We can both say that, sir. I'm just, I'm just a nurse trying to protect the patients and do mm -hmm. what my hospital has obligated me to do. Believe it or not, I'm trying to protect him, too. I have two officers now. Another so officer Warrant. They don't have PC. Is this patient under arrest? Nope. He still says he's not under arrest. Do you have an electronic warrant? No. No. No to every single one. So let me hold on, Brad. So I printed this off. This is what I was told to print off. I have this. It says obtaining blood samples for police enforcement from patients suspected to be under the influence. This is something that you guys agree to with this hospital. The three things that allow us to do that are if you have an electronic warrant, patient consent, or patient under arrest. And neither of those things, the patient can't consent. He told me repeatedly that he doesn't have a warrant and the patient is not under arrest. Okay, so I take it without those in place, I'm not going to get blood. Am, am I fair to surmise that? Alex, you're not Yeah. Okay. I don't know. I have no idea why he's blaming me. I'm just representing. Why are you blaming the messenger, sir? She's the one that has told me no. Ms. Wobbles reads the hospital policy involving police blood draws to detective pain and explains that because the patient is not conscious to give consent and is not under arrest, the officers cannot draw the blood without a warrant. Earlier in the interaction, detective pain had argued that so-called implied consent laws apply to the situation and allow him to obtain the blood draw. Under Utah's implied consent law, which can be found in section 41-6A-520 of the Utah Code, quote, a person operating a motor vehicle in this state is considered to have given the person's consent to a chemical test or tests of the person's breath, blood, urine, or oral fluids for the purpose of determining whether the person was operating or in actual physical control of a motor vehicle while having a blood or breath alcohol content statutorily prohibited under the influence of alcohol, any drug or combination of alcohol and any drug, or having any measurable controlled substance or metabolite of a controlled substance in the person's body. However, the statute also requires that, quote, a test's or tests authorized must be administered at the direction of a peace officer having grounds to believe that person to have been operating or in actual physical control of a motor vehicle while in violation of any provision. Therefore, Utah's implied consent law unquestionably did not authorize Detective Payne to obtain a blood sample from the unconscious patient, as he had no grounds to believe that the patient had been operating a motor vehicle while impaired. We will examine the constitutional issues involved in police-ordered blood draws in a moment, but for now, it's important to note that contrary to Detective Payne's apparent assertions otherwise, Utah's implied consent statute does not allow officers to test someone's blood simply because they chose to drive in the state. And even if it did, such a law would be plainly unconstitutional. Yeah, but sir, you're making a huge mistake right now. Okay. okay. No, we're done. We're, we're done. You're under arrest. We're going. We're done. We're done. She can sit in my car I'm while we're coming. This is unnecessary, man. You're this right. Is this is my department, and this is completely unnecessary. I'm leaving now with her. Okay? Anybody who wants to prevent that, that's your option. He will be taking them. Please, sir, you're hurting Then walk. No, I have no reason to walk. Have a seat. What?
is going on? Hi, sir. Hi. Would you like to speak to this young lady? Well, I need to talk to you first, and then I'll talk to her. Okay. So what's so they're there? arresting her for obstruction. She's called people. They say no, she will not take me up there. She absolutely will not. Thank you. I have our privacy right. officer on the phone. They're busy. Give me a second. Okay, let me chat with her for a moment. Yeah. We're breaking the law. Can you if we're doing please wrong, call okay. Tom Miller. This is what you're you. Listen to me. If we're doing wrong, there are civil remedies. What I'm telling you is, no. we are not making a mistake. Okay, I've done this for 22 plus years. I know what the law is when it comes to search and seizure. What you have done, because your bosses are telling you to, has been to prevent this officer who was called out to do a job to do his job. That's obstructing justice. Okay. Watch Commander Lieutenant James Tracy, who is Detective Payne's supervisor, arrives on the scene and informs Ms. Wobbles that he is well-versed in search and seizure laws, and that she has obstructed justice by preventing Detective Payne from obtaining the blood sample. Now, in general, the Fourth Amendment protects citizens against unreasonable searches and seizures, and a warrantless search of the person is only considered reasonable under the Fourth Amendment if it falls within a recognized exception to the warrant requirement, such as the so-called exigent circumstances doctrine, which applies when an emergency make the needs of law enforcement so compelling that a warrantless search is objectively reasonable. In the 2013 case of Missouri v. McNeely, the Supreme Court determined that taking a blood draw, quote, which involved a compelled physical intrusion beneath McNeely's skin and into his veins to obtain a sample of his blood for use as evidence in a criminal investigation, was a search for Fourth Amendment purposes because, quote, such an invasion of bodily integrity implicates an individual's most personal and deep-rooted expectations of privacy. The court also concluded that the, quote, natural metabolization of alcohol in the bloodstream does not create a per se exigency that automatically justifies an exception to the Fourth Amendment's warrant requirement for non-consensual blood testing in all drunk driving cases, and that whether a sufficient exigency exists must be determined on a case-to-case -case basis. Nonetheless, it is essential to understand that the exigent circumstances doctrine only applies when an officer has probable cause to believe that the individual was driving under the influence. It should also be noted that in the 2019 case of Mitchell versus Wisconsin, which was decided several years after this interaction occurred, the Supreme Court held that when, quote, the driver's unconsciousness requires him to be taken to the hospital before police have a reasonable opportunity to administer a standard evidentiary breath test, they may almost always order a warrantless blood test to measure the driver's BAC without offending the Fourth Amendment. However, the court clearly limited this holding to situations where, quote, police have probable cause to believe a person has committed a drunk driving offense. In this situation, there was no evidence to support any sort of suspicion that the unconscious patient was intoxicated, let alone probable cause to justify a blood draw under the exigent circumstances doctrine. And as a result, the officers essentially arrested Ms. Wobbles for refusing to allow them to violate her unconscious patient's Fourth Amendment rights. Is this person, do you know, is this person a resident? You know, we're trying to get blood I have no idea. I don't even know who he is. Okay. So you're, why are you involved in this? Because I'm, have anything to do with because it. I'm the charge nurse in the unit that he was admitted. My job is to help understand where, what we're supposed okay, to do and how. Not, you're not trying to understand. You're trying to tell us how. That's all you're doing. Because he's going to tell me what your policy is. And I understand what your policy is. I'm trying to tell you what I need to leave. Okay, and your policy right now is uh, contravening what I need legally. Overall, the officers held Ms. Wobbles in the vehicle for about 20 minutes before eventually releasing her without filing any charges. In late 2017, Ms. Wobbles reached a $500,000 settlement with Salt Lake City and the University of Utah without even filing a lawsuit. Ms. Wobbles told reporters that she would use a portion of the money to help people obtain body camera footage of incidents involving themselves for free. The Salt Lake Police Department conducted an internal investigation into both officers involved in this incident. During this investigation, Detective Payne claimed he was simply following Lieutenant Tracy's orders to arrest Ms. Wobbles if she did not allow him to draw blood, and Lieutenant Tracy claimed that Detective Payne withheld essential information from him regarding the situation, including the fact that no probable cause existed for the blood draw. In October of 2017, Detective Payne was terminated for his part in Ms. Wobbles' arrest in a notice of decision issued by Chief Mike Brown. The 17-page letter noted several violations of department policy 
policies and informed Detective Payne that, quote, your conduct toward Ms. Wobbles was inappropriate, unreasonable, unwarranted, discourteous, disrespectful, and has brought significant disrepute on both you as a police officer and on the department as a whole. Detective Payne appealed his termination to the Salt Lake City Civil Service Commission, but the results do not appear to have been made publicly available. The department also decided to demote Lieutenant Tracy to a Police Officer 3 position, which is two steps down from his previous rank of lieutenant. Chief Brown also issued a notice of decision to Lieutenant Tracy explaining his demotion, in which he listed several policies that Lieutenant Tracy had violated and stated that, quote, your immediate and impulsive decision to order Detective Payne to arrest Ms. Wobbles without first taking the time to fully inform and appraise yourself of all the relevant facts and circumstances has adversely affected public respect and confidence in the department and brought significant disrepute on both you as a lieutenant and superior officer and on the department as a whole. Chief Brown also noted in the letter that, quote, I was disappointed in the manner and tone with which you spoke to Ms. Wobbles and hospital administration. You did not exhibit the requisite courtesy and respect we expect from our watch commanders. Lieutenant Tracy appealed his demotion to the Salt Lake City Civil Service Commission, and in 2019, the commission upheld Chief Brown's decision to demote him. In 2019, Detective Payne filed a lawsuit against the department in the city, setting forth claims of breach of contract, breach of implied duty of good faith and fair dealing, wrongful termination, defamation, libel, and or slander, and false light publicity. Although Detective Payne's attorney at one time claimed that he wanted to apologize, Detective Payne later told reporters that he never intended to say he was sorry because, quote, I don't think there's anything that I need to apologize for. Instead, as Detective Payne claimed in his lawsuit, he believed that the department made him a, quote, pariah and fall guy, and that he, quote, took the blame for what was apparently an out-of-date policy handbook and whole-scale failure to train officers on what the law was and how it would apply to the given situation. In January of 2022, Detective Payne's lawsuit was dismissed at the request of both Detective Payne and the defendants. This likely indicates that the parties reached some sort of settlement agreement, but the details have not been publicly released. As a result of Ms. Wubble's arrest, the Utah State Legislature passed HB 43 in 2018, which updated the state's implied consent law to clarify more explicitly when police officers are authorized to take blood draws in potential DUI cases. However, it should be noted that HB 43 did not change the substance of the law, and the attempted blood draw involved in this incident was in clear violation of Utah's implied consent law as it existed at the time. Overall, Detective Payne gets it's an F for repeatedly attempting to bully Ms. Wubbles into allowing him to obtain an unconstitutional blood sample, demonstrating a complete lack of understanding of implied consent and exigent circumstances laws, and forcefully arresting Ms. Wubbles for simply doing her job. Although Detective Payne claimed he was just following orders, police officers are individually responsible for knowing and complying with the law, and he cannot excuse his ignorance regarding both the applicable statutes and the Constitution by blaming a superior officer. I agree agree with Chief Brown's determination in his notice of decision, in which he told Detective Payne that, quote, It appears to me that, despite withholding all of the relevant information from Lieutenant Tracy, you quickly made the decision to regard his order as justification for performing a custodial arrest of Ms. Wubbles, who had already become the object of your irritation. The evidence strongly supports the conclusion that you viewed Ms. Wubbles as engaging in contempt of cop, and chose to use Lieutenant Tracy's order as a shield to allow you to punish her if she persisted persisted in telling you no. Detective Payne's repeated refusal to take responsibility for his own mistakes or even apologize to Ms. Wubbles for his cruel and unconstitutional actions is inexcusable and clearly demonstrates that he does not have the demeanor necessary to be an effective and professional member of law enforcement. Lieutenant Tracy also gets an F for ordering Detective Payne to arrest Ms. Wubbles for refusing to allow an unconstitutional blood draw, berating Ms. Wubbles for telling Detective Payne no when she was well well within her rights to do so, and speaking to Ms. Wubbles in a rude and condescending manner when he was actually the one who did not know the law. Although Lieutenant Tracy claimed that he did not have all the relevant details and blamed Detective Payne for failing to inform him that no probable cause existed to support the blood draw, I find this assertion questionable at best, as he can clearly be heard in the body camera footage telling Ms. Wubbles that the patient was the quote-unquote victim in the crash. 
Even if Lieutenant Tracy was not specifically informed that probable cause was not present, the fact that the blood draw was being attempted from the victim of a crash should have raised red flags about the constitutionality of the blood draw, and a professional officer would have confirmed the details of the situation instead of just assuming that the blood draw was lawful. Just like Detective Payne, Lieutenant Tracy appeared to be infuriated that Ms. Wubbles dared to tell a police officer no, even though she was simply attempting to set boundaries protect her patient's constitutional rights, which suggests that Lieutenant Tracy has an overinflated sense of his own authority and a lack of respect for the rights of citizens. Additionally, the condescending manner in which he spoke to Ms. Wobbles was particularly appalling, given just how wrong he actually was about the situation. And in my opinion, Lieutenant Tracy should be grateful he only received a demotion. Ms. Wobbles gets an A+. Plus for maintaining a professional and respectful demeanor for the majority of the encounter, ensuring that the officers did not conduct an unconstitutional blood draw on an unconscious patient, and standing firm in her professional and ethical obligations to protect her patient's bodily integrity, even when faced with repeated threats of arrest, and when speaking to Lieutenant Tracy after she was handcuffed and placed in a police vehicle. Although she did lose her composure during her forceful arrest, she appeared to simply be afraid and outraged, and this is a perfectly understandable response to such unimaginable behavior by a police officer. I commend Ms. Wobbles for her courage and integrity in the face of police ineptitude, and her fierce commitment to protecting her patient at all costs. Even though she should never have been put in this situation in the first place, I hope others can learn from her example of how to refuse unlawful police orders in a firm and respectful manner. Let us know if there is an interaction or legal topic you would like us to discuss in the comments below. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to check out my second channel for even more police interaction content.